Welcome everyone uh, to the briefing on Ukraine, avenues to safety and meeting immediate needs. Uh, my name is Hannah Behrens. I'm the director of the Migration Policy Institute Europe. And I'm pleased to uh, welcome you all to this webinar this afternoon, where we're going to be looking at the EU response to uh, the displacement situation um, from Ukraine. Uh, I'm joined today by four panelists. Um, they are Esther Pozovera, the head of the asylum unit at the Directorate General for Migration and uh, Home Affairs at the European Commission, by Alexander Sorel. He's the senior advisor to the executive director um, at the European Union Asylum Agency. Also, um, we have with us today Sophie McGuinness. She's the senior, uh, she's the head of the policy and legal uh, support at UNHCR, uh, the representation for EU affairs. And then finally, we have Yasmin Sloches. She's a senior policy analyst at uh, our institute here at MPI Europe. Uh, before we start today's event, uh, just a few housekeeping um, rules and also information that we would like to share with you just to make sure that you can all follow and, and signal any problems that you may face during the webinar. Um, so you can contact us at events at migrationpolicy.org or at the number uh, that you see on your screen if you have any access issues. There will be no voice question and answer um, part. So if you want to ask uh, one of our panelists a question, please use the Q&A uh, function or chat function. You can also write us at events at migrationpolicy dot org or tweet us at migration policy or hashtag NPI discuss. Um, the audio from today's webinar will be available later today uh, on our website migrationpolicy.org slash events. Uh, and if you want to check out uh, our related commentary on this particular issue, you can also find that uh, on the website um, with the question, is Europe prepared for a possible large scale Ukrainian displacement crisis? But we'll now launch into uh, the actual events. As said, we are joined here today by four panelists, three of which played uh, a really a pivotal role in the past days and week uh, in terms of really shaping and designing uh, the response to displacements we see unfolding uh, from uh, Ukraine. Um, and in terms of the displacement, the, the, the figures are rapidly uh, evolving. The displacement crisis is potentially huge. Uh, looking at the UNHCR data portal, we now have more than two, 2 million Ukrainians who have fled their country. Um, most of them have arrived for the moment in, in Poland. They're at 1.2 million um, Ukrainians already on their territory. There's about um, uh, 200,000 in other European countries, but also uh, yeah, lots of people arriving in Hungary, approximately 200,000 in uh, uh, Slovakia, 190,000. So the displacement issue is, is really particularly uh, important. And as um, the High Commission of Refugees said um, just a few uh, days ago, this is fastly proving to be uh, Europe's um, largest displacement crisis since the Second World War. We have seen that the EU and the member states, both, both public authorities, but also other actors have really showed uh, a massive outpouring of support, um, lots of different initiatives in different uh, countries, uh, all making sure that refugees can uh, use public transport, use mobile data networks to communicate with friends and family or parts of the or their, their diaspora community can move uh, to other parts of the country or potentially to other parts of Europe. And only last week we had the council making uh, a historic decision in terms of activating uh, the temporary protection mechanism, uh, the first time ever since it was adopted back in 2001. And also um, there's a, a, a group of, of, a large group of UN organizations, but other also partners who have quickly uh, stepped into gear and made sure that there's now uh, a Ukraine regional refugee response uh, plan available to support. Uh, those who are affected by this particular crisis. And we'll get uh, to that in a second. But let's first uh, turn to uh, Esther Pozovera, um, who's, as I said, the head of the asylum unit 
at DG Home. Um, Esther, you've played a, a really important role in the last weeks in, in making sure that the first the commission could put this forward to the council, but then also the council could um, take this historic vote. Can you tell us a bit more about the temporary protection mechanism? Um, what does it entail? What are the implications for those who will benefit from it, from this kind of status? What does it also mean for, for member states and their national asylum authorities? And yeah, can you also shed light on the, on the why that, uh, of this uh, historic nature of this decision that was made last Thursday? Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Hane, and uh, thank you to you and the NPI Europe for organizing this, uh, this seminar, this webinar. I think it's, uh, it's very important as well to, to have timely information and for people to understand what, uh, what we have now on the table, what is going to be implemented. It has been implemented already since Friday last week. So, and maybe before we uh, give you a bit of what is in the, in the decision, uh, just to give you a bit of the background to this. Uh, uh, the week of the 20th of February, we started using UNHCR and um, other United Nations organization scenarios about what would be the influx of people. We could see people coming into the European Union already. And we have different options. On the 24th of February, uh, the worst fears become uh, real. And uh, basically, we started opting for, for the options that we have uh, envisaged for more stream scenarios. And, just on um, our commissioner on during the you know there was the uh, JJ council meeting on the 27th and uh, basically on the 27th of February uh, my commissioner was still not sure whether we were going to to go for the temporary uh, protection directive for the activation or not she was even very cautious among us to say well let's see what member states say and uh, when she went into the meeting and then uh, after the meeting, it was clear that it was a broad support by all member states to activate the temporary protection directive. And in the evening, she gave us a phone call, start working on it. And uh, so that was uh, Sunday evening on uh, Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. The commission adopted the proposal. And you can imagine that if this is a commission uh, and knowing our internal procedures, this was done in the speed of light. Uh, so basically with a lot of... Uh, night without uh, much sleep or much food uh, for, for weeks. I think we all lost in the team some kilos uh, as after this uh, TP. And uh, because we knew that this uh, proposal had to be discussed in Corepe on, uh, on the 2nd of, of March. And uh, during the Corepe, there were some differences among member states regarding the scope. Uh, there was an um, extraordinary meeting organized of JJ councillors in the evening. And then on Thursday, we still didn't know whether we were going to go for uh, adoption by the council or not. And uh, during the, uh, the day of the council meeting, there was a lot of negotiations going around and uh, there was a strong, extremely strong commitment by all ministers that these needed to be adopted on the third that there was the need for, for showing uh, the, the support and the capacity of the union to respond very rapidly to the situation. And uh, as you know, the, there was an unanimous decision by the council on the 4th. Uh, all member states were fully supporting and fully on board with the, the decision to activate it. And on the 4th of March, the decision was published and entered into force, which means that 4th of March is the moment where temporary protection is granted to everybody who's coming on the union. So this is the date that you have to take into, into account in your mind, because it's where the one year starts counting. Um, so what is in this? Why, um, why we decided it's an unprecedented, I will explain why now, but maybe just to, to give you an idea that what the, the beauty of the temporary protection directive is that it's an extremely flexible instrument, so it gives a lot to the member states to regulate according to what they want, but it's also, it provides a very good set of harmonized rights across the Europe, so it's a win-win for the persons that might benefit from it and also for the member states. For the person themselves, because we basically cut the red tape in the sense that you are granted temporary protection, is a declaratory decision. So you don't have to apply for temporary protection. This is granted by the decision. The only thing you have to do is basically to ask for a residence permit and this residence permit will trigger the other rights. So it's, it's very quick. Um, in the sense, we define the scope. We just have to prove that you fall 
uh, under the scope that is included in the decision, and then you are given a full branch of, of rights. And these rights include um, access to the labor market, access to education, access to healthcare uh, in emergency cases, access to social welfare. So it's a set of harmonized rights that we hope that will give an adequate protection to the people that are fleeing war, that are fleeing this conflict. But it's also a win-win for the member states because we, as we said, we cut the red tape. This is very quickly to do, but also we hope that because the directive already offers this minimum set of rights that are quite advantageous if you compare to the rights that asylum applicants have, we hope that these people will not ask for asylum immediately because they are already protected. And that means that the asylum sisters of the member states will not be overwhelmed by a, an inflow of um, massive applications of asylum. And why we say this, because if you look at the scenarios, we're talking between 2.5 and 6.5 million people that could be displaced into the European Union. And based on the experience of 2014, when there was the, uh, the, the event in Donbass, and Crimea, uh, we expect about 50% of those to apply for asylum. So you can imagine that for the whole asylum system to have millions uh, applying for asylum can be extremely burdensome. So is win for is it win win for everybody? For the persons concerned, because they receive immediate rights, and for the member states, because they uh, we are protecting their asylum systems from being overwhelmed. Uh, nonetheless, the people covered by temporary protection can still apply for asylum and the member states have an obligation to, uh, to allow them to, to apply for asylum. What is the scope uh, of, the, of the temporary protection decision? Here we have defined, uh, we have one date that is very important, which is the 24th of February 2022, which is where the conflict started. And this is for us, like if you wish, the cutoff date. So anybody who was in UK, to simplify, I will go into the details, but you have to have been in Ukraine on 24th of February. So if you were outside Ukraine on the 24th of February, you're excluded from the scope of the temporary protection decision. So starting point is 24th of February, 2022. And within that, we have Ukrainian nationals that were residing in Ukraine on the 24th of February, 2022, and have been displaced because of the conflict. Then we have also persons that were enjoying refugee status or adequate national equivalent status in, in Ukraine, also before that date, and they were in Ukraine and then they move, and their family members. And then we have uh, also third country nationals that were residing in Ukraine on the basis of a permanent residence permit. And they are unable to return to the country of origin in safe and durable conditions. And here member states have two choices. They can apply the, the temporary protection under this decision, or they can apply in an adequate national protection. Uh, in both cases, the people, the third country nationals that were residing in Ukraine on the basis of a permanent residence permit have to get protection. But this protection can be either through the decision or through the national uh, system. Mm -hmm. This is the, just because there are some misunderstandings about third country nationals, so I wanted to clarify. So they have to be granted protection. Mm -hmm. What happens if you win uh, somebody who were already in the EU? We knew that somebody were already coming into the EU just before um, the conflict. Uh, we also have examples of people that were on holidays on the European Union. We have a couple of examples of uh, uh, families in Spain that were in Tenerife. Um, uh, and then there was the, 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 the conflict and they cannot go back to the countries of origin. They are excluded from the scope of uh, the decision. But we are encouraging member states to also cover these people, to also apply the decision to these people, people that have short before 24th of February or they found themselves in the European Union, they could still apply. And this is important because in general, the directive is minimum, is really the minimum standards. So member states can apply the decision to other categories of people. And they can also provide for more favorable conditions. So the rights that I explained, access to the labor market, access to education, access to housing, social welfare, this is the minimum. And the member states can always provide for more. The uh, decision also establishes a mechanism for exchange of information between member states. 
uh, to know exactly, particularly the reception capacities, where the reception capacities of each member state are, because there is a possibility always in case one member state is completely stretched out uh, to try to help them and provide for the support. Uh, so why now? And here I conclude. It's a mixture of pragmatism, concession, and all the stars aligning. Um, this directive was made in, in 2001, just after uh, the, the, the Balkans war. And, um, and basically, it, we thought we would never have to use it, to be honest, because we never thought that we would be confronted with a similar uh, situation in Europe. But here we are, we are in a situation of war, which is... Uh, it's very sad for us. It's a historical moment, no doubt. It's an unprecedented move by the, by the Union, but it's also a very sad moment. But uh, if you look at pro in pragmatic uh, ways, Ukrainian nationals, they benefit from um, visa-free. They are visa-free travelers, so they can enter and move within the European Union for 90 days. They have a, if they have a biometric passport. So they can basically move inside the territory. And during these three months, they can join their family and friends. There's an important diaspora in the European, in the European Union of Ukrainians. So um, in terms of um, creating this balance of efforts that the directive wants is the best mechanism to do it. Um, we wanted the member states to be ready for day 91. And this is uh, the best instrument to do so. And also, if you look at the numbers, um, as I said, it's between 2.5 to 6.5 million. We have in five days, 1 million people. 1 million people in five days. This would have collapsed completely. If everybody started asking for asylum, it would have completely collapsed the whole system. Um, so the best way of tackling this is to say, this group of people are going to be granted temporary protection. And then for this year, they can be relaxed, they can be happy, and then we can see if the situation evolves or, or how the situation, um, if they feel the need to, to apply for, for, for protection. And also it was very important for the union to, to show support uh, towards Ukraine and uh, towards the, 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 the situation right now in, in Ukraine, and to do that very quickly and across the union is a manifest what is really important about the tp is that this is a european status it's not a german status it's not greek status it's a european status and it also sends a very strong signal um uh, to towards ukraine so this is in a nutshell what it is and i'm sure there will be uh, some questions um and um i hope i will be glad to to answer them Thank you very much, Esther. I mean, I think that was really interesting to, yeah, the, the understanding why this has happened now and in, in the current context, but also uh, you taking the time to explain the scope, because we know there's been a lot of questions raised and also in social media, different versions circulated. So I think it was very important to clarify that. And I've also noticed that in the Q&A, there's are actually some questions that were asked that you have in the meantime already responded to in your answer. So, so thank you very much uh, for that uh, as well. And also explaining that this is the minimum standard in terms of the kind of, uh, but that member states can also opt to either uh, expand the scope or um, apply more favorable um, uh, rights as, as you've explained. Let me now turn to, to Alexander Sorel. Um, as I mentioned before, he's the senior advisor to the executive director at the EUAA. Um, and Alex, uh, yeah, as we were saying, the next step is, of course, to implement this in practice. And we also noticed already that in the Q&A uh, section, there are questions about how do we know that um, what steps will be have to be taken by uh, Ukrainians to, for example, prove that they're eligible uh, or how do they apply for such a residence permit? So we know that a lot of uh, national authorities are now and already last week were preparing for the implementation of, because it's such, as, as Esther said, it, the wonder, the wonderful uh, dimension of this is that it grants immediate protection, but of course we want to make sure that, that people um, have uh, access to it. And so, uh, yeah, it would be great if you could come in uh, on that. We know that there's no manual lying around. This is the first time it's triggered. And so a lot of this will have to be developed um, on the go and on the basis of questions by different uh, member states and authorities facing. But we would be really interested because of course, back in 2001, uh, uh, Alex, the, the UA didn't exist. And of course, this is um, a great added value that we have today that we can bring in the expertise and uh, 
the resources that uh, this agency has now. So this is quite a powerful uh, uh, um, yeah, dimension of this. And it would be really interesting to see how you may envisage, I know it's all still question mark, the role of the EUA in this uh, particular phase. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thanks, uh, Hannah, for the invitation and the organization of this uh, very timely seminar and uh, webinar. Um, yes, you, you already said it, uh, the TP is, TPD is from 2001. Um, I indeed will say something um, of the uh, some of the things that you just mentioned, and hopefully um, I will already answer some of the questions. Some of the questions, some other questions will probably not be uh, be answerable. Um, for instance, because um, the guidelines are not yet uh, uh, there, um, uh, but they will soon be there. So that will probably merit uh, a new uh, webinar. Um, indeed, TPD 2001, EASO, the, pre the predecessor of EOA, was established in 2010. Um, EOA was given a mandate, an extended mandate, which only entered into force two months ago. Um, just to make a point that we are quite new on some of the extended mandate uh, points. Um, our mandate is uh, limited between uh, entre guillemets to asylum and, and rece uh, reception uh, issues. And um, I say that because um, it's important for us being uh, able to, to help member states on the temporary protection, uh, implementation of the temporary protection directive. Um, the council decision of 4 March creates that legal basis. Um, we wouldn't have been able to, 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 to help member states um, Without that clear legal basis, now we have it, so we are actually very pleased to to be able to support uh, member states to request um, our uh, our support. Uh, we, uh, uh, there has always has to be a formal request, whether it's on uh, on asylum and reception issues or now on temporary um, protection issues. Um, as the decision says in uh, I think Article Three. Um, that the JHA agency should provide operational support to member states that request assistance, including for the purpose of applying the TPD. Um, so we will support member states on the normal asylum procedure and reception, as well as, uh, um, so we will continue with that and also uh, do that now on the implementation of the TPD. It has never been uh, applied before, it was said. And it's, you said it in other words, is learning by doing. Um, we know that national authorities are currently grappling with questions related to registration, um, Article 10, exclusion mechanisms, Article 28, information provisions, Article 9, the interplay between TPD and the asylum procedures, Article 17, the complementarity between TPD and the um, the national protection uh, systems, is somewhere in the recital, and of course the solidarity measures. We as EOA organize, promote, and coordinate the exchange of information and best practices. We already do that, and now we are uh, stepping up our activities um, in response to the, uh, to the situation in Ukraine. I will give you uh, three uh, examples of that. The country of origin information specialist network met last week to discuss emerging country of origin information needs. Day-to-day -day monitoring of the situation in Ukraine is ongoing. Today, the reception network met to exchange on contingency planning, preparedness activities, and the impact of the situation in Ukraine on reception systems. On the 16th of March, um, the asylum process network and the country guidance network will, uh, will meet. Um, we are also considering the possible development of new tools, guiding materials, and targeted training packages that may assist member states uh, when they are implementing the TPD. In parallel, we will also work on tools and guidance and training to assist member states in the examination of asylum applications. Um, we know that despite the fact that uh, the TPD, some people, uh, and you see an increase, um, still apply for asylum applications, and we will concentrate on specific profiles like draft evaders and deserters and well, you know why we would do that. Um, 
We were also contributing to the enhanced situational awareness in the context of the Blueprint Network and the IPCR, the EU Integrated Political Crisis Response Mechanism on the situation in Ukraine. We're also collecting asylum applications data on a daily basis. Normally, it was on a weekly basis, but now we, we accelerated it to a daily basis at the request of the Commission, among others. And we're also starting to collect data on TPD-related indicators. Uh, last Friday, we published a situation, situation update on the rapid response by EU plus member states to address the needs of the displaced uh, people from Ukraine. And this situation update covers development in areas in those member states uh, in legislation, entry requirements, te temporary protection, asylum provisions and reception and so on. And if uh, all goes well, no, it's not. Um, if you want to see that, it's uh, available on our uh, EOA website. Um, it's a public uh, public document. Now let's move to the operational support. As you know, we are primarily mandated to provide operational and technical assistance to member states where their systems are under pressure. We, at the moment, have eight member states where we are active. Greece, Italy, Malta, Cyprus, Spain, Lithuania, Latvia and Belgium with a budget of 90 million euros for this year. We recently also um, finalized the joint rapid uh, needs assessment and uh, drafted an, an operational plan with another member state that could well be the end of this week, number nine. We have a wealth of operational experience um, on all the areas of asylum and reception, but also on relocation. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic provided also a new impetus on the use of digital technologies in our operations. In the framework of Ukraine, we stand ready to provide all that operational support if requested and within the limits of our uh, extended mandates and resources. Um, and we are, of course, in discussion with um, uh, the Commission to see uh, how and when we get additional resources which may be well needed for for um, giving the support to uh, those member states. At the moment, we only received so far uh, an official request by one member state, that's Romania. At the moment, a rapid joint needs assessment is being carried out already, together, of course, with the Romanian authorities. And um, then the operational plan, because it's always a needs assessment operational plan um, signed by the two sides, and then we can, uh, can start going. It will be formalized uh, shortly. In the framework of the solidarity platform established by the Council, coordinated by the Commission, we are ready to provide our knowledge and expertise to help coordinate the reception efforts and support possible transfers between member states that with the aim of achieving a, a balance uh, of efforts. Of course, we, we are building here on our experience in the context of relocation for instance, of unaccompanied minors in, in Greece, but also the post uh, SAR disembarkations in Italy and Malta the last few years. It was said many times the decision to apply is historical, but we must also realize that this is just the first step. Operalization for the first time of the provisions of the TPD in the current situation, and we just heard 2 million people is a formidable task for all, for all involved. We stand ready to assist national authorities, the commission, work together with and coordinate with our sister agencies, of course, UNHCR and IOM, and other UN agencies that are already active on the ground with all the tools that we have uh, in our mandate. And we are, uh, I'm ready to answer questions uh, if need be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. I mean, I think that was really interesting in terms of also, of course, uh, looking first at, at the mandate and how that's changed and how that plays into your potential role here. But also, um, yeah, I think you gave us a, a beautiful mosaic in terms of the responses going from the more kind of general steps that you may take through, for example, the reception network, thinking through what is the capacity, what can be done, what kind of tools or, or other kind of training can be offered to member state authorities in different kinds of challenges that they may face and it will be very similar across the EU 
but also in terms of the operational support and yeah, the yeah, interesting to hear about Romanian needs assessment going on uh, there. So thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, let me now turn to Sophie McGuinness. Sophie, as I said, is the head of the policy and uh, the legal support unit at the UNHCR representation uh, for EU affairs. Uh, Sophie, um, yeah, we can also say that UN agencies have been really quick out of the, the starting block to also address the, uh, the situation um, because we're, of course, now for the moment focusing on those who do cross the borders, but there's also, of course, internally displaced and have been for, for quite a while. Um, we're really interested to hear more about the, the, the regional refugee response plan that we have started together with the UN family and other organizations of late to get a bit of a more understanding what its aim is and how it's seeking to sort maybe different kinds of groups that are being forced to move because of the, the invasion. And also what would be interesting to see is how does it um, complement or potentially bridge what the temporary protection mechanism is trying to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, let me start by thanking you, Hannah, and all the team at MPI Europe for pulling this event together so quickly. Um, it's always impressive how MPI can mobilize around key developments, and I'm looking forward to listening to um, additional speakers here today and to the Q&A that's going to follow. I think other speakers have, have noted it too, but it's important to to take a moment to, to, to reflect on the truly momentous nature of events in recent days. Uh, first, there is, of course, the tragedy of Ukraine. As you mentioned, Hannah, we've reached a total of over 2 million refugees who have fled Ukraine. That's 2 million people in less than two weeks. Second, there's the triggering of the, uh, by the EU member states of the Temporary Protection Directive. As we've heard, this is an unprecedented development which will provide immediate protection in the EU for Ukrainians and third country nationals with refugee or permanent status in Ukraine, and hopefully groups beyond that also. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Esther, who's with us here today, um, and all her colleagues at DG Home for working day and night to produce the Commission's proposal to trigger the TPD in record speed, and congratulations that that was indeed adopted. And third momentous event is the reaction from people in all EU member states, uh, particularly those bordering Ukraine and all across the EU. Hearts and homes have been opened to the people of Ukraine and it's incumbent on all of us working in the sector now to support and protect that generosity now and for the years to come. I'd like to say a few words about what we're doing at the UN and then turn to the implementation of the temporary protection regime and what we can do to assist that at the UN. The United Nations is working to support states in responding to events in Ukraine. Last Tuesday, the UN launched two appeals. The first is a flash appeal for inside Ukraine. So that's dealing with the IDPs, uh, internally displaced persons who had been displaced before the conflict, um, but also those newly displaced uh, since the invasion. The second appeal is a UNHCR-led regional response plan, which is aimed at supporting refugees in neighboring countries, so principally in EU member states and in Moldova. Our appeal for inside Ukraine is for just over $1 billion for a three-month period from March until May. Uh, part of that, as part of that appeal, UNHCR is focusing its efforts on protection, shelter, and cash assistance for IDPs. The appeal for the refugee response plan, so dealing with refugees leaving Ukraine, stands at just over 500 million US dollars. This foresees a scenario that 4 million refugees will leave Ukraine. Um, we published this plan uh, on Tuesday of last week. We're already at 2 million refugees. Um, so these numbers are indeed set to grow. And as Esther has mentioned, there are some larger scenarios as well for greater displacement that the United Nations is also working on. Under this appeal, the Refugee Response Plan, UNHCR is supporting neighboring countries, so those countries neighboring Ukraine, in preparing warehouses for core relief items, distributing life-saving core relief items, preparing the distribution of cash to those in needs, supporting the dissemination of information, 
providing counseling and psychosocial support and ensuring the overall coordination of actors in support of national authorities. We have over 115 staff in Ukraine at present. Um, many of those staff have had to be relocated multiple times, um, but UNHCR is staying and delivering. And when conditions allow, our colleagues and partners uh, are out delivering uh, key aid uh, to, to people who have been internally displaced. We are hoping that progress can be made on ceasefires and humanitarian corridors so that we can deliver more aid as quickly as possible. But we have been um, pre-positioning aid in warehouses in Ukraine and on the border so that we're ready to move material when we have the opportunity to do so. We also have uh, over 100 staff in, in countries neighboring Ukraine, mainly in EU member states and in Moldova. And we've reinforced those operations, sending more resources, staffs and stockpiles, including by moving stockpiles of material from Greece uh, to other EU member states who are receiving the large majority of refugees. <clears throat> Our High Commissioner has visited Romania, Moldova in Poland in recent days. For more information on all of our activities, um, I would refer people attending to the UNHCR data portal on the Ukraine situation. I think the easiest way to do that is just to Google uh, UNHCR data portal Ukraine, and it should come up for you. Uh, there you can find our data portal with all of the statistics, which are updated many times a day, but you'll also find links to the appeals that I've mentioned. Turning now to the rollout of, of temporary protection, uh, I'd like to address some areas where UNHCR can help and share some ideas on immediate and long-term needs. First, UNHCR is assisting with addressing immediate needs. Um, while many member states have already gotten national temporary protection regimes up and running, uh, and this is really welcome, where there's already access to services, um, others have not yet uh, managed to get those services and access up and running, so support is needed. UNHCR is preparing cash-based supports as a transitional measure so that refugees in need of support can access it pending the full implementation of temporary protection EU-wide. So for example, those refugees who are arriving uh, in EU member states and in Moldova, who don't have family networks, um, who don't have a possibility to move on and, and get assistance from, from family or diaspora, and who are perhaps just a few days or weeks away from being able to access national services. This is where we're working with partners to roll out some cash-based supports. In addition, um, the flexibility that member states have introduced at border crossing points are very welcome and we fully support them. Um, we also very much welcome the guidelines that the Commission has produced again at breakneck speed to encourage EU member states to introduce flexible measures at borders so that refugees can access territory. Um, and there's some very good uh, advice in that guidance. As in any refugee movement of this size, protection issues unfortunately arise uh, in particular for women and girls. Uh, and on International Women's Day today, we need to commit to do more to ensure that women and girls are spared further harm when they arrive to the EU. UNHCR and UNICEF issued um, a statement yesterday on the need to pay particular attention to the situation of unaccompanied minors. And we're following up on that statement with, with key partners. Second, in addition to these immediate measures, um, we also need to be thinking in terms of the longer term already. I'm sure we've all seen the scale of offers of accommodation from, from citizens and people across the EU. There are great initiatives, including online platforms where people can pledge a, be a bed. Uh, there's quite a few of these initiatives in, in Germany. We've seen them in, in many other EU member states. These initiatives need to be harnessed and supported so that they can be scaled up to meet uh, the growing needs. We understand additional funding streams for the refugee response in the EU uh, and elsewhere will be announced by Commissioners Johansson and Lenertich this afternoon. And of key importance will be figuring out how this funding can trickle down to people and small organizations on the ground. There's a lot that's been done uh, in recent months and years, building up uh, what we call community sponsorship models in EU member states, 
which are there to support refugees coming in on, on, uh, on, on resettlement, but also refugees coming in uh, to the EU under other complementary pathways. And I think we need to look to see how we can scale up some of those initiatives to support uh, more accommodation places for, for Ukrainians and others fleeing Ukraine. And finally, just a couple of points I'd like to touch on to guide the policy decisions that are going to come on the rollout of temporary protection. And we've heard uh, from Esther about the guidelines that the Commission is preparing, um, and it's great that that's in the works and will be produced uh, quickly. Um, so that's a very welcome development. Um, but just a couple of points on, on things that would be good to touch on in that guidance. I think the first is on the need for a very broad application of the temporary protection uh, directive and the decision that ministers have taken. Um, I think it's clear that that will be very well covered in the guidance from, from the clarification that, that Esther, you kindly provided on the application of the T TPD. Um, and we would also, as UNHCR, encourage member states, as no doubt the Commission will, to take a very inclusive approach to the application of the Temporary Protection Directive. In addition to what the EU member states decided themselves um, in the Council decision of last week, last Friday, um, it's important to remember that the Temporary Protection Directive itself at Article 7.1 says that member states may extend temporary protection as provided for in the directive to additional categories of displaced persons over and above those that are set out in any decision by, by member states. So we would really encourage member states to, to make the best use of this opportunity as they can. It is the best vehicle to deliver immediate protection and it's also the best way to avoid a buildup of cases in the asylum system, which we all want to avoid. Um, I think the second broad area of, of, of guidance for the rollout of temporary protection would be its swift implementation. Um, we perhaps don't need to push this too far because so far things have moved extremely fast, but it is uh, important, uh, I think, that the, that the guidance should really encourage all the EU member states and um, hopefully at the same harmonious time to move forward and to implement uh, the temporary protection directive fully. In terms of the national measures, it's very welcome that several EU member states have gone ahead and implemented temporary protection at the national level. Um, it perhaps might be difficult in time to assess if the measures at national level are indeed exceeding those that are set out in the temporary protection directive. Um, and we would perhaps encourage uh, the Commission and, and, and others to provide as much guidance as possible to member states so that they, they know exactly the level that they need to reach in order for their national measures to be considered appropriate, um, providing appropriate protection under, under what was agreed by the ministers last Friday. And finally, just a point on the key issue of registration. Um, registration will be happening at the national level and it's very important that that be harmonized across all, all member states uh, in terms of registration being recognized uh, in other member states. Thanks very much and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Sophie. That was a, a great uh, outline, both in terms of the, yeah, the, the support on the ground that you referred to, but then also really showing how some of the support that um, you and other agencies will be supporting really helps to make sure that there's no operational gaps or cracks where people may um, finally yeah, find themselves in because they have to wait to access the temporary uh, protection mechanism and the, the, the statuses and, and the rights that have been laid down in, in that instrument. So I think that's really uh, an important one. Um, and thank you for, for outlining the points. Uh, let me now turn to our colleague Yasmin Slochus, uh, as mentioned, she's the she's a senior policy analyst at MPI Europe, and she is one of our key integration specialists. Because, as already alluded to, um, also by Sophie uh, Yasmin, 
Uh, there's, of course, um, challenges further down the road in terms of uh, short term, medium term um, questions that arise um, both by national authorities, but also local authorities, uh, the diaspora community uh, working with them. I saw that also in the Q&A uh, section that there was already questions also by local authorities made as to how will this all work? Um, I mean, what, what we've heard from, from Esther uh, is, is that it's great. This really allows um, those who arrive from Ukraine to quickly um, access protection. But at the same time, we know that the, the, the local communities will face a situation where uh, the, the profile of the people who arrive very mim mimic uh, the profile of, of asylum seekers, of newly arrived, and a lot of the challenges are there. And so uh, that will be uh, a key question. So if you could take us through some of the questions that they will be facing and thinking through, what are some of the next steps on that front? Thank you, Yasmin. Yes, thank you so much, Hannah, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel, and thank you to all the excellent contributions of the other speakers. Uh, I think it's absolutely true what you are saying. It's crucial to focus on emergency support and emergency needs right now, but we already have to take the next step and start thinking about what is coming next. Uh, looking forward, uh, thinking more about medium-term needs uh, and uh, medium-term uh, needs for support. Uh, and here there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, previously, emergency support or immediate reception has been tackled separately from uh, long-term integration. And this is a lost opportunity. There's different skills, different sets of expertise, uh, different actors working in these areas. And if this issue gets tackled more together uh, jointly with a joint approach, uh, they can leverage each other's expertise, ex each other's experience. So I think this would be uh, helping to think more long term and at the same time leverage the skills and uh, experience they already have at the same time. Uh, Moreover, uh, if we look at the situation right now, uh, of course, it's, it's an exceptional situation, but we do not start from scratch. We have uh, a lot of experience and we can capitalize on the lessons that we have learned in the past. For example, during the large influx of migrants in 2015, 2016, but also during a challenging situation, we are just coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and also integration systems have been shaken up. Uh, so some innovations that we could, for example, learn from and benefit from right now is uh, leveraging digital innovation in language learning and integration courses uh, that prove to be a very uh, cost effective way to support integration. Uh, in interviews with policymakers, we noticed that during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, especially uh, migrants with children and migrants with jobs, uh, benefited from online integration courses and participation rates actually increased. And this is especially interesting considering the demography of the current group of migrants that are coming in, often women with children. Uh, other lessons that we learned, for example, is the intense ramping up of uh, school placements in education, in housing. We've seen it in Sweden, in Germany, and already now in Germany, for example, we see that protocols from uh, 2015 have been reactivated to cope with the influx uh, of refugees. So we can learn from the lessons, learn from the protocols and strategies that we had back then and adjust them to the current needs. Um, Lastly, uh, during these different situations, we've seen an increasingly complex and diverse set of stakeholders uh, becoming active in this area. We see the private sector, we see civil society, uh, we see an increased role for local government, uh, and also increased collaboration across levels of government and, of course, across all these different stakeholders. And we can leverage these collaborations and these more joint approaches uh, together. Yet, uh, when zooming out uh, a little bit and looking more at the broader policy context, we do see a bit of a challenging uh, context, but also with lots of opportunities. Uh, looking, for example, specifically at housing, uh, we see that there are uh, shortages of housing across Europe and especially of affordable housing. This is also the case in Poland, one of the countries that is receiving the bulk uh, of the displaced individuals from Ukraine at the moment. Uh, Yet we can see uh, that uh, the outpour of energy and the outpour of support, we can build on this. Uh, for example, there's already what uh, Sophie mentioned, there are maps, there are databases with private accommodation, 
uh, Airbnb offered over 100K apartments. Uh, there's real estate agencies that are providing empty apartments for free. Uh, so we see uh, this, this outpour of activity. In addition, maybe it's interesting to reflect on a more a different change that happened during the pandemic. We are all joining this event online. There's increasingly more people working online and office buildings are also emptying up. Uh, potentially there can be a repurposing of office spaces uh, creatively. And there's ex experience with this across countries. So we could leverage this. How can we quickly remodel an office space into an apartment or into a, a livable uh, space? Um, the questions here, of course, who are the actors at the table? How do we bring them together? And how do we learn from all these different initiatives that are happening at the same time? Uh, when we move our uh, attention towards education, uh, we see that there has been a shortage of uh, teachers uh, in most European countries, uh, including in Poland, a Czech Republic, and in Hungary. Uh, so this, uh, considering that I think at least on Friday, about half that of the individuals crossing the border were children and would require access to education. It's very important to make sure that children have access to education. Um, and of course, there has also in this area, uh, it's, it's caused by an issue that at the same time potentially provides a solution. So we see a shortage of teachers, it's a labor shortage, but at the same time we have an influx of individuals that could potentially plug these gaps. The same is true for healthcare. Uh, healthcare systems have been stretched to their limit uh, during the pandemic. Uh, there's a lack of healthcare and nurses uh, and personnel. Um, so there is some potential and opportunity here, yet we cannot just simply assume that individuals that are fleeing war, uh, experiencing uh, great uh, stress, um, can simply pluck these gaps. We have to facilitate this and think about what do they need, uh, including uh, mental health uh, support, um, also skills recognition, making sure that qualifications are recognized on the labor market, um, and matching uh, employees, employers with the, uh, the people that are coming in uh, to suitable positions. Uh, there, there's a lot that we can learn from and a lot of reports that we have written, research that academics have done, uh, and it would be really an, an excellent moment to use all that we know uh, to prepare for the more medium and long term. Um, thank you. I'll leave it here. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for the whistle stop tour. Uh, I mean, there's like you say, there's so many different dimensions that need to be tackled. And I noticed that already some of the, uh, the participants have responded in Q&A with interest, for example, on, on the digital learning that you, you refer to. Um, yeah, there's also big questions on, on the labor market integration front, because we know that on the one hand, there's a long term, term tradition of people coming in and, and working from this nationality. But as you say, there's a different kind of uh, profile coming in so we need to be really aware and uh, um, may there be possibilities also for the EU to think about in terms of uh, jointly uh, working on, on skills recognition and alike uh, for the people who come in so this is again another opportunity that can be seized at this very moment in time to facilitate their entry into the labour market so really interesting things that uh, all of us will be exploring in the next uh, weeks but I would like to now uh, turn to, to Esther we only have a a couple of minutes left, unfortunately, for the Q&A. Uh, we apologize in advance to the participants, uh, but we wanted to make sure that all uh, of the panelists could really shed light on the current situation. But Esther, you've been carefully following all these questions, lots of questions on the application and, and implementation and who will be eligible and who not and the procedure. Maybe also, uh, maybe if I can just add one question to that, are you intending of, of setting up a kind of a web page or something alike where some of these questions will be, um, because I presume you're getting lots of similar ones from different authorities, will you be gathering that information and making that somewhere available or people can access maybe this in the next days or weeks? Thank you, Esther. Yes, actually, there will be one uh, which is addressing Ukrainian nationals and third country nationals uh, fleeing Ukraine. That it should be online either today or tomorrow. And with all the questions and answers of uh, who is eligible, who is not eligible, what are my options, etc. For the member states, we, we're discussing, uh, we would like to have something similar, a bit dynamic. So not only guidelines, but really to have something a bit more dynamic. 
actually just wanted to say that on qualifications, the colleagues from the college, uh, the colleagues from uh, I think it's DG Grow, they are working actually on guidelines on the recognition of uh, of certificates, and uh, so we are all gathering. There's also another DG working on housing. So as you can see, uh, there are all the DGs that are trying to to work and and looking at how we can implement these uh, temporary protection decision in the most efficient way possible. So lots of uh, documents coming up in the next days. I've been following the vast majority of the questions. I think they are for me. So I'm going to very quickly go through them and you will see. So the first question, does each EU member state determine how one asks for a residence permit? Yes, this is left to, the, uh, to each member state. It is up to them to decide how they issue the residence permit, what kind of residence permit. The only thing that is clear is that they have to provide a, res a residence permit that will grant access to the labor market uh, and to the other rights. So um, on issues on the scope, uh, asylum seekers, uh, people that were in Ukraine on short-term visas, uh, they are not covered by the temporary protection uh, decision. The same goes for people that were already in the European Union before the 24th of February 2022. They are not covered by the decision. However, I will invite you to read recital, uh, recital 14, in which we are actually encouraging member states to apply the decision also to this group of people particularly to those that were already in the European Union before the 24th of uh, February, is recital 14. And um, Article 2.3 uh, also reminds member states that they can actually apply the decision to other groups. So we are actually in a way, even if we didn't need to include this in the text because it's already in the directive, we just wanted to remind member states that this was an option. Uh, so it was a way uh, to, to encourage them to, to be as flexible and generous as possible. I was reading today, for example, in the press, that Spain is going to extend the scope to all the Ukrainians that were uh, residing already in Spain, even in on, on a regular basis. Um, so this is all well, the questions related to, to scope. Um, so if you were a refugee in Ukraine, yes. If you were an asylum seeker in Ukraine, no. Unless you were an asylum seeker with some kind of permanent residence permit, which I cannot exclude. Uh, we're still trying to gather information from the Ukrainian authorities about all the, the residence permit they are giving. Uh, the residence permit is, as I said, given by the member state authorities. So uh, if uh, I'm going through all the lists. Uh, so in principle, this residence permit includes the right to access the labor market. So with this residence permit, yes, in principle, uh, it should be sufficient for somebody to hire you, to hire somebody that uh, it's benefiting from protection. The... Um, they can move inside the European Union. And I invite you to read recital 16 of the decision when we actually explain this. So during those 90 days, they can move and they can choose the member state in which they want to avail from their rights because their rights are given by the temporary protection, the decision. Huh? So it's just that you have to go to an authority and it depends on each member state. But for example, I can imagine here in Belgium, it would be the commune. And, and then you ask for a residence permit and then you submit all the papers. Um, so somebody who was yesterday in Poland might be today in Belgium. Once they get the residence permit, they can still move around. They can still move around for, uh, for 90 days in period of, periods of 180 days. In addition, um, in principle, if you move, let's say that you are benefiting from, uh, from temporary protection, you're right, uh, you decided to get your residence permit in Poland. And for whatever reason, uh, in six months time, you decide to move to the Netherlands. And you go to the Netherlands authorities and you ask for this, uh, the permit. In principle, uh, the member states agreed and this was a declaration by the ministers that they will not implement any take back uh, request. So in principle, the Netherlands have committed not to send the person back to Poland because in principle, you should enjoy your right only in one member state. The member state that gave you the residence permit. But uh, they can, the person who has a residence permit from Poland or from Germany can move to another member state. 
If you follow the directive article 11, in principle, uh, let's go to the Netherlands, you should be able to send the person back to Poland and say, no, it was Poland who was uh, given the rights. Unless there is a bilateral agreement between Netherlands and Poland not to apply this. But how it's going to work in practice is because all the ministers made a declaration on Thursday that they will not apply this article. In practice, there will be freedom for all of them to choose where to go and there will be, and even when they got a residence permit from one member state, they will still be able to move to another member state and ask for a residence permit in another member state. I hope that this is uh, clear. So they will not be obliged to return. This is uh, one of the questions. And temporary protection, yes, uh, a person can choose. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, okay, you can go and, and decide to, to opt for a legal pathways. Uh, it's not excluded. Temporary protection is at the minimum. So you think that in your conditions, it will be more advantageous for you to so do something else, is it would be possible. So once a st state is granted, um, it works only in the member states where you that gave you the residence permit. But as I said, you can move to another member state, and 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 then in that member state, say, give me a residence permit. I actually changed my mind, and I don't want to uh, av avail of my rights in Belgium. I want to do it in France, uh, for example. Um, Russian nationals were resident in Ukraine, are they included as well in the protection? Um, so uh, the Russian national, again, it has to show that is part of, uh, it has uh, was residing in Ukraine on a permanent uh, residence basis. Uh? Either the, it could be, I don't know if there are um, Russian refugees in, in, in Ukraine, um, but if it was a Russian national that was residing in Ukraine on the basis of a permanent uh, residence permit, in principle, yes, it, it benefits for, provided it cannot return to Russia in safe and durable conditions. So that's a bit the assessment that the authority will have to do, because in the case of third country nationals with a permanent residence permit, they have to show that they cannot go back to their countries of origin in safe and durable conditions. If local and regional authorities have a role, that depends on the member states. It's not up to, uh, to us to decide, it's uh, each member state. Um, so there is no limitation to the labor market. The only limitation of access to the labor market is that the member state may treat as a priority uh, EU nationals and nationals of the European um, uh, economic area. Uh, on the forecast, I think we have already said, um, and the day duration, yeah, the duration, there was a code. Okay, the duration is uh, based on objective reason. It's not based on a personal basis. So. It starts on the 4th of March, 2022. It will end on the 4th of March, 2023. So somebody who comes uh, today, it will get a residence permit up to 4th of March, 2023. If this person comes in December, 2022, it will still get a permit until 4th of March, 2023. But then this permit can be extended in six months period for another year. So if nothing happens, if the commission doesn't come with a proposal to the council saying that in our view, the situation is good okay now. So uh, basically we should stop temporary protection and the council agrees. The, the residence permit will be automatically extended for six months periods twice. So for another year in practice until 4th of March, 2024. What happens on the 4th of March, 2024? If the Commission thinks that the situation is still not good um, and there are no possibilities for people to go back to the countries of origin, the Commission can come with a proposal to the Council to extend temporary protection for yet another year, so until 2025, and it has to be adopted by the Council. What the Commission can do always is, during all this period, we can always come with a proposal to the Council and said the conditions are not okay, in our view we can stop temporary protection and then the Council can adopt a decision to stop temporary protection. Huh? So it doesn't matter when you came. It was, it was yesterday, it was tomorrow, it is in six months time, the permit is the same until 4th of March 2023 and then extended for another year. Um, and then for where to get this permit, it really depends on each member state. For some member states might be the local authorities, for other member states might be the authorities in charge of asylum. It really depends on each member state. On the website that we are preparing today, we are actually listing 
providing the websites of the member states, the ones that have been notified to us, so that the people can actually access the website in the member state where they want to enjoy these rights and see what they have to do, to which authorities they have to go. Some member states are aware, uh, they are preparing leaflets, and uh, some of them are very good, like the Slovak leaflet is very good. Um, so we are also collecting this kind of, uh, of examples. Um, so I think I, I replied to the one on the people before the 24th of, uh, of, uh, of February. How is the implementing in practice? So in, in practice, uh, is, uh, this is what I just replied. Uh, permanent for, for, can anyone elaborate on the actual kinds of Ukrainian residence permit? The Ukrainian authorities, they have sent us actually examples of residence permits they have. Uh, so we have received one that says per, it's actually a permanent residence permit. I think it's a five, if, uh, five years. After five years, you get a permanent residence permit. So we will have in our guidelines actually an annex with the, with the models that have been provided by the Ukrainian authorities to us. Um, the UK is not involved, it's not part of the European Union, this is a union decision. Um, uh, there was some question about the US. Uh, the US has granted temporary protection only to people that got stranded in the, in the US. So people that were uh, on holidays or for work reasons in the US and now they cannot go back to, to the EU. So it's a complete different, it's a complete opposite approach. We are granting temporary protection to all that are coming now. So it's uh, so we have an open-ended number of people uh, that that could be could be covered, whereas the U.S. only to those that have been um, standard. And um, for all the rest, I think uh, um, the the solidarity platform, because there are several questions about this. Uh, just to say that. Um, now we have to see uh, what uh, can be, what is needed and what is not needed. Huh? We are collecting the information. We have the blueprint, the member states are reporting and they will also report by the way, because they have an obligation under a directive if they have extended the scope of application of the decision to other groups of people. So we will get that information. We will also get information of whether they are granting more uh, favorable rights. Um, but what we are doing now is to see if there are needs in terms of um, additional reception capacity so they cannot. And it will, the solidarity platform will cover everything. We'll cover financial needs. It will cover probably also resettlement because we are getting interest from the US, from Canada as well to, to resettle people from Moldova and also from, from the EU. And uh, it will also cover all the needs for transfers between member states. We don't call them relocations because relocation is for applicants of international protection. These are people that have temporary protection in the EU. So um, this will also be covered by, by the transfer. So I hope I covered, if not all, at least 90% of the, the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. This is amazing. I think uh, very few people have the chance to get, uh, yeah, to speak to you and, and actually have firsthand information, you being, uh, you know, being an important person in this whole process, holding the pen uh, for lots of this and really being able to uh, respond to this and also based on all the questions I think you've been faced uh, been facing the last couple of days so you're completely prepared with so thank you very much uh, I saw in the Q&A chat there was already lots of appreciation for you really tackling all these questions and giving as people say yeah providing uh, correct information or clear information is, is so crucial and so um, once you I mean we'll make sure that through MPI as well that we share the the website where some of this information will be gathered from your site so that we really see there's some excellent answers being uh, said in the chat so thank you very much Esther I'm very conscious of the time so um, and we're already uh, over time but I just wanted to ask one more question to Alex and then unfortunately we'll have to close but uh, to participants do feel free to reach out to us with questions or comments uh, after that uh, Alex I, I just wanted to ask uh, one more thing I mean we've We've heard about the, the solidarity platform. We know about the blueprint mechanism being um, activated also in relation. And so there's, I saw there was a couple of questions about how will uh, the EU monitor the reception capacity within uh, member states? How will they uh, make sure that uh, different countries are in a position to host these people? And so we know that the EUA and the EASO before that has really played a, a, a really important role in, in mapping uh, the capacity within the EU over the past years and, and keeping close track with it. And you also have, of course, a strong team supporting you with that. Can you give us a little bit more information on how you will be feeding in information on these kind of issues 
in the next days and weeks when it comes to yeah, the different mechanisms we discussed. Thank you, Alex. Um, it is. Um, it sounds a bit like um, that, that we're doing something specific. Uh, almost sounds like monitoring, which of course we're not doing, um, at least not until the end of a, we don't start until the end of, a, of 2023. But what we do irregularly is um, uh, collect uh, information you know, from all member states on all issues, also on reception uh, capacity and, um, and the capacity and, and contingency planning. Uh, and we put that in our, uh, our database. Um, and we put in our database only vetted information, so it's vetted by the member states, so it's, it's correct. Of course, this, this is a, an internal one, which will probably, but as a side, uh, side note, uh, become much more public uh, in, the, in the time to come of the EOA. We, we are planning to make that more accessible to, to others. So we know a lot of things. Um, I think that the, the most challenging thing is here is that um, I, yesterday I was just in the Netherlands and um, I spoke to also about UK. There was not the reason why I was there, but I spoke to immigration service, the, the reception service, uh, the ministry, and especially the reception service says yes, and they were a bit embarrassed because the Dutch have a huge problem in reception uh, and they have to, you know, ask. Uh, um, cities and villages for you know please please come at it and now suddenly there is that they, they 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 come you know you know spontaneously yes we have and like three weeks or three months ago they said no so there, there is also i'm giving you the example to to show that we might thought there was a capacity x but the situation is so different from before and you can have all kinds of second thoughts about that but that suddenly much more capacity becomes available um which is in a way good and that information that needs to be collected of course it needs to be uh, uh but there's there's much more um absorption than previously probably we thought based on on the official figures it is much more um you know private um you know to well, one and a half a week ago, I was at a dinner where the the Julio de Blasio, you know, Julio, that there's so much um, offers from private organizations, from the the, the, the the private sector to do things like that. There's so there there will be much more um, reception capacity available, which means that there might not be a need. In the short term, to to uh, to do the solidarity mechanism. And the solidarity mechanism, you know, we have experience, but the Commission will have to uh, to get with us and others come up with a you know a dedicated uh, practical uh, huh, operating procedures um, how it will work because it's not it is it looks like relocation, but it's not of course because this there, there needs to be a, a double uh, voluntariness so the individual and the country where they go to need to agree so it's quite uh, special uh, so we'll see it's exciting okay. times yeah i think we'll, we'll it's a good note to end on a promising note in terms of the possibility to to upscale um reception capacity as you say and making sure that we harness the different kinds of um creativity that we see and the outpouring of support that we've witnessed in the past couple of hours and days and uh, and really making sure that we use that to the, the best effect for, for those who are arriving on, on, in Europe. Uh, we would like to really thank um, our four panelists. It's been a really interesting uh, discussion and very much um, in the heat of the moment as uh, different mechanisms are being designed and next steps are being um, yeah, uh, written as, as we speak. So this has really uh, been a, a very useful and unique opportunity for all so I thank you again for making the time amidst the very busy schedules and I know lots of uh, follow-up meetings are, are to be held even today. Uh, just for those who participate, thank you as well for joining us today and listening into uh, and posting all the different questions, uh, lots of really interesting questions and I hope we managed to, especially Esther, uh, respond to many of those. Uh, the audio and the video from today's webinar will be available later today on our website migrationpolicy.org events. 
uh, you can contact, um, uh, if you are any reporters on the call, you can contact our communications director, Michelle Mittelstadt, at the number on your screen or at mittelstadt at migrationpolicy.org. If you would like to receive any updates on the work of MPI and MPI Europe, uh, do visit our website and there is a possibility to sign up there. Uh, and as mentioned, there's the related commentary. But uh, from my side, I would like to wish you a nice continuation of your day and all the best in these um, very busy and, and challenging times. Thank you very much.